Well, welcome to Testable Faith. I'm Hugh Ross, the founder of Reasons to Believe, and I'm joined by a fellow astronomer, uh, David Block, mm. a professor at Fitzwater Sand University in South Africa. And uh, David, uh, you've got quite the story of how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. Mm. First, tell us a little bit about your family of origin and what kind of spiritual background you started off with. Mm, with pleasure, Hugh. Firstly, what a joy it is to be here personally again at Reasons to Believe. Hugh, I grew up in the Orthodox Jewish faith, which meant that I was a good Jewish boy. I would go to Shul Synagogue on a Friday night on Shabbos. I would partake of the high holy holidays. I would enjoy Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. I would fast on Yom Kippur, the day of the fast, but I had no assurance that my sins were forgiven. I had no assurance at all that God was alive. Amazing to say that, but I would uh, I'd thrive on joining the family at, uh, you know, uh, celebrations of the different feasts and so on. But it was all just wonderful tradition. I'm sure you've seen the film, Hugh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's all just filled with rich, beautiful Jewish tradition. But uh, whether God was alive or not was in, beside the point, really. But you were raised in a loving family that had... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. A very loving family. And then the clock moved on to 1969. And Jack Bennett, you'll remember, discovered a very famous comet yes. known as Comet Bennett. Spectacular it comet. It was just spectacular. Well, the yeah. most no, spectacular I've ever seen with the naked eye, you right. know. And I saw this comet. I didn't know what a comet was. So I had to go and read up about comets long before Google and so on. And I read about what comets are. But, you know, Hugh, Comet Bennett, st its tail stretched almost halfway across the skies. It was just unbelievable. And I just... The comet itself was about the size of the moon. Well, that's sky. correct. Yeah. Absolutely. It's one of the most beautiful comets I've ever seen. There I am, a youngster, perhaps 14, 15, 15 years old. I was born in 54, so 1969. Bennett's Comet appears, and I go out in the morning. They used to still deliver milk in milk cans, you know. The, and so I wondered about the awesomeness of the universe. And then my father bought me a little telescope, a four and a half inch reflecting telescope, and I became enamored with the night skies. I remember vividly pointing my telescope at the planet Saturn and asking myself the question, where is God in all of this? I see such awesomeness, I see such purpose, I see such design, but to me, God does not exist. He comes out of the mouth of the rabbis in terms of great rabbinical sermons, but a personal God, not at all. Then I entered university. A few years later, I entered university. And Hugh, a friend of ours, you mentioned a loving family, a friend of my parents, the late Professor Lewis Hurst, who was a professor of genetics and psychiatry, uh, at Wits University, he asked me to teach him, give him weekly private tuitions on astronomy. And so we would meet regularly mm -hmm. on a week-by-week -week basis, and I'd teach him about the wonders of the universe and the elegance we see in the universe, and maybe some of the math, too, behind the elegance. And he just said to me, David, what you're teaching me is mind-blowing. It's just unbelievable. And I said, Professor Hurst, it really is. But I said to him, you know, Prof, one thing really worries me. God is dead. And I remember flying off to a meeting which Stephen Hawking was present to. I'd been elected a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, as you know, in 1973, I believe. I was 19. And I flew to London. And Stephen Hawking addressed the audience. But there was no God there. I couldn't sense the, the vibrance. I couldn't sense the reality of God. And I flew back to South Africa, and I told Professor Lewis Hurst, Prof, God is really dead. I've even been now with Stephen Hawking, some of the greatest minds on the planet. But I remember feeling so isolated, so alone. And yet, and yet, the observations of Saturn were impregnated upon my mind that there must be, still be a personal God out there. 
And one day, Professor Lewis Hurst said to me, David, would you like to meet a friend of mine? I said, of course, I'll meet anyone. And he said, come and meet a very dear friend of mine, the Reverend John Spaker, who was an Anglican minister. And I'll never forget this, Hugh. This is now fast-tracking to the year 1976, so I was 22. And uh, John invited me into the manse, John Spaker, and he stood up when I walked into the room. And he said, when I think of the evangelical work you are going to do, my blood runs cold. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant, you. When I think of the evangel, I didn't know what evangelism was, really. Probably had heard of Billy Graham as an evangelist. But <laughs> when I think of the evangelical work you're going to do, my blood runs cold. And then he said to me, David, may I just read one verse to you from the Bible? And remember, this is not in a church setting. This is in the manse. And we'll have tea together and you may go home. And so here in the manse is John Spaker, um, Professor Lewis Hurst and myself. John just opens his book, his Bible, and he reads me this verse from the book of Romans. Romans 9, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, but they who believe on me shall never be ashamed. And suddenly by the Spirit of God you, everything fell into place. Behold, I lay in Zion. That's my territory mm -hmm. as a Jew, right? Behold, I lay in Zion, a stumbling stone. Now, as a Jew, Hugh, I knew I could be involved in spiritualism, Buddhism, any other ism. But don't ever mention the name of Jesus. That name was you don't mention that name. So you actually recognized immediately that was a stumbling block? Absolutely. And wow. I don't know how, except I do know now by the Spirit of the living God. But he was to be a Jewish Messiah. For behold, I lay in Zion, not in Rome. For behold, I lay in Zion, a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And there again, you could speak of anyone else but speak of Jesus, and Jews would be very, 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 very highly offended. So I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, but here was the promise, but they who believe in me, but they who believe in me shall never be ashamed. And Hugh, right there and then, in October of 1976, I was 22, I said to him, I said, Reverend Spaker, Please pray for me to meet my Jewish God. I don't know what words I used exactly, but something along those lines. And Hugh, we simply bowed our heads and he prayed. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. It was like warm water. That's all I can remember, just the most wonderful warmth. And I can say this to you. Suddenly, from believing that God was dead, I knew that I knew that I knew that my Redeemer lives. You know, as Job says, mm -hmm. for I know that my Redeemer liveth. It was a movement, Hugh, from darkness to light in October 1976. So you actually understood the concept of redemption at that moment? I could, I could immediately sense a sudden release within my being that uh, I don't recall the words that John Spaker prayed over me, but I knew that I knew that I knew that I was born again that day uh, in October of 1976. And yes, I knew for the first time ever that my sins were forgiven, whereas before I would fast and hope that they would be forgiven. I had the utmost assurance eh, that God was alive, that God was righteous, that the Old Testament was completely uh, infallible, the New Testament as well, and everything just came into a glorious, harmonious whole. Okay, we only got a minute left. What happened in the days and weeks that followed? Well, far too much to put into a minute, but basically... Much persecution over time, as you can imagine. Much persecution. But I sit here today, and whatever persecution I 
have had you fades into insignificance. Why? Because he, Jesus, King of the Jews, is the God of grace and of truth. As a scientist, I greatly admire truth, of course, and grace, amazing grace. How amazing to save a wretch like me. Well, thank you, David. And if you want to get more resources uh, from David Block, go to reasons.org and just search for David Block. That will pop up for you several video clips and other resources that you can enjoy and share with your friends. Thank you. Thank you.